everyone. Welcome to today's Variety Hour. Um, we are really, well, I am personally really excited about um, all the talks that we've got coming up today. Let's get on with the show. Um, we have five speakers today uh, talking about four different projects ranging from um, earth observation capacity building to low cost accelerometers um, to track turtles and um, 3D forest mapping and um, uh, and then our longer talk today is all about um, WWF's work to develop um, satellite ear tag transmitters for polar bears. So really excited to hear an update on that project because it's been going on for um, quite a while. Um, but enough from me. I'm going to throw over to our first presenter, which is Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth, do you want to take it out? Take it away. Uh, so good day, everyone. Uh, Ken uh, Mube with Dish South Africa, uh, now uh, working remotely, but now in Nairobi, colleagues everywhere in the world. So Dish South Africa is a program which is empowering access to data powered by AWS, uh, unlocking the promise of tomorrow from the, what we studied from the past. So the program uh, hosted now currently at the South Africa National Space and uh, working with partners across the continent, but the program actually has its origin from Australia where we have Digital Australia. So we have amazing products in the continent, all of them free uh, to use, uh, good stuff for the evening as well, uh, from coastlines, water, cropland, et cetera, et cetera. So also the program has been there the last three, four years and working closely to get some impact stories, which is amazing stuff that has helped us to get the funding so far. So some of the stories range from coastlines, mangroves, uh, working agriculture food security, looking at some phenomena on the lakes, urbanization, and more specifically for the context of today, how uh, we are supporting conservation and et cetera, et cetera. So in this particular context, uh, one of the amazing stories we had was the rehoming of giraffes uh, in Lake Baringo, just in a small island called Ololekwe. And the other question is, uh, how did the giraffes get themselves in some island? So over many years, it was said that uh, the island was more safe for the giraffes and uh, because of conservation, and uh, they have been there the last 30 years or so. But the phenomenon is that from climate change and from what we could see from our images, from vegetation, from water, we could see uh, the island was shrinking in the middle of the diagram and the giraffes had to be relocated around April 2021. And we are working with the Kenya Wildlife Service and the conservation uh, organization around and we were able to provide the right information in terms of the right time and actually relocate them to where there's enough pasture, what you can see from space, uh, platforms like Digital Africa. Uh, this one we worked with our partners, where I actually used to work with the UN Foundation, supporting SDGs, but not forget as well the conservation. Uh, moving forward, the similar story we had in Northern Kenya, we are supporting the same institution, Northern Lands and Plus, to get an awareness of where, how the communities actually live in terms of conservancies, and uh, we were able to use the local knowledge to actually update the conservancy plans in terms of where they can graze and how they can actually move the animals and coexist with the community, which is very impactful. Uh, then as a summary is that all these services we have from coastlines, you can connect with us. Uh, recently, we looked at the mangroves. Uh, recently, we looked at some uh, amazing stories, urbanization, and also we have free online resources. And as well, we keep uh, our stakeholders busy. Every week we have live sessions in Wednesday in English and French, and also an opportunity to connect with these uh, happy uh, happy people everywhere. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Kenneth, that was the quickest talk in the world um super interesting i'd i'd um i'd love to hear more about what's what's what brought you to work with um uh digital earth africa uh the program is the passion to support the various communities that is from space to village and the program offered that opportunity where we fit into the ecosystem so we started with five countries before then now we scale up to the whole continent and every country you go is a different story different engagement and everyone is very unique in terms of the citizens actually have the solution is to actually show them the tools that they can actually use so that they can live peacefully and coexistly and we've managed to have some footprint in 10 countries and uh, the other uh, plus which we need to cover 55 means working more with partners so we are currently working close with the african union to bridge this gap through various programs and opportunities even being at this forum is quite a way of connecting to a country uh, which is very useful so that we leave no one behind if you could get who would you want 
most to be listening to this talk and the, who would you be really excited to hear from afterwards and like so what would they be doing and what would they be partnering you with you on uh i think the most important people like even the how been come i came to know about these talk is the young people like Esther, the young people are really passionate. They are coming out of their way. Like two weeks ago, she was at Africa Climate Week sharing some amazing stories and even giving us the connections. So once we have the young people on board, uh, we're able now to reach to more communities because in some of the use cases you've seen, the young people through the youth mappers are giving us the local knowledge, citizen generated data that you can actually help to validate the products that we have. And then with the young people, in a few years, they'll be the future leaders of tomorrow, even the president of Kenya will be actually in this call. Thank you. Um, and one last question before we move on. Um, what what do you see the big potential of Earth Observation and, and the work that you're doing? Where do you hope it's going to go in five years or how do you hope the technology is going to develop? Uh, the technology with the recent uptake and uh, the government's taking up technology, it will actually save costs, like some of the opportunities you've seen, like in Tanzania, is to save them on the census that, they, that they're actually doing, uh, reporting on the environmental indicators, reporting also on SDGs, because now we already now have seven years to go. So using these technologies will empower the governments to save on costs and actually do much more for the community in terms of delivery of services so that uh, the technology will leave no country behind. They're all at par. It's just the tool to actually know where the resources are and well a good allocation of the funds uh, in the right uh, areas so that we save the money and we save lives, providing better data for better decisions. Awesome. I think that's a great point to end on. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Ken. And I'm going to throw across to Wing Sing now to talk about um, his work with accelerometers and a cryptic spe species of turtle. All right, take it away. All right. So thanks for having me here. I'm Sun Sen and I'm doing a PhD at the University of Hong Kong. So, so far I've been mostly focusing on the movements and behaviors of freshwater turtles. So here today I'm going to share with you about our default model of accelerometer and how it helped transform our understanding about the ecology of this elusive species. So first of all, turtles are declining all over the globe because of a multitude of human impacted, human induced impact. Yet I would say our general standing of the taxa remain pretty much very limited. So say for example, here's my study species and the focus of my today's talk, the big-headed turtle. So their populations were heavily depleted because of poaching activity, but despite a dire conservation status, there has been later information about when they become active during a day, but this information served important lessons for assessing and managing the species, like planning a patrolling protocol or designing a monitoring scheme. So mostly we think they are nocturnal, but we don't know any case about, is that, is that really true? So part of the major reason is that they are really small to put a track on them. The average weight of our monitoring populations like less than 300 grams. And I've rarely seen a individual that is weighting more than one kilos. So if we are to deploy tax on them, they will be lightweight. And this often come with a trade off that the tech will have a really brief window of for measurement and are considerably more expensive. So with this in mind, we partnered with Brian, who is our engineer for the project. And he helped us to model this accelerometer for us using Arduino platform. So the tech basically composed of four components that you can readily buy online. And this tech, those components are really cheap to produce, compact and lightweight. So we have provided all the code in the web page that you can get them from the QR code below. And a major advantage is that we are now configuring the tech sampling mode so we can set according to our own agenda. This means we can extend the battery from probably recording continuous sample for less than a day to over two to three weeks following a stratified sampling approach. So with this, we fed our data into a hidden Markov model, and now we can delineate basic behavior when a turtle become active and when they are stationary. What come up with a surprise is that contrary to our common belief, instead of being a strictly nocturnal species, female presented its more crispuscular activity here 
and more males is more of like a cathedral species that active both during both day and night. So the default tab right now, we are placing it within a C-block bag and then after it within a layer of parathlam before enclosing the entire unit with epoxy. But there is still over one third of our deployed attack has different form of damages. One of the major reasons is that this turtle is highly aquatic in nature and they inhabit in rocky stream. If you look into the video, they're just high underneath the rocks. So many of the time, they find their way between plates of rocks, squeezing themselves into some really small crevices. So in some cases, we have our attack scraped off its fire surface. So because of this kind of rampant living styles that we they are having. So if we were continue we were to continue this project, I think one of the top list of my wish list is to having a battery and casing approach. The approach has to be ready to deploy keep and the casing material has to be both heavy duty and waterproof while not significantly increasing their weight or the buoyancy or increasing the drag force for attack. Of course, I guess it would be all of our movement ecologists dream to have a small attack, but one of the major complications, I guess, would be having a smaller battery size. So I think one of the really cool research that's recently published that if there is a more efficient power supply system, something like kinetic energy harvesting system, perhaps I guess we can resolve a lot of issues that we are having right now. And a more mechanistic perspective, I guess another major challenge right now is to there is limited information about how to delineate for the behavioral classification. Uh, something like a camera system that you see in this paper may help to help us to decode accelerometer profile into actual behavior in the field. And that would be really useful, I think, in the future. So all in all, I just want to channel out to the community that we need more study for the taxa for reptiles and amphibians. I mean, we are now at the age of golden age of biologging technology, but I still think there is huge taxonomic bias that we must overcome, especially for the field of herpetology. So with that, I would just thanks for having me here and thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take any of your questions. That was so cool. I didn't realize um, that you actually built, uh, designed and built the um, the, the tag. Uh, that was that was a great presentation, getting lots of um, thanks in the chat. Um, so two questions. So one, one comment, Katie, who you referenced with the stereo camera, I actually asked her to speak today and she wasn't able to make it. So she's going to be speaking at next Friday hour if you want to connect cool. with her. Um, and you, uh, it was great to see your wish list. But you said if we were to continue this, so what's your what are your plans for um, for the accelerometer system? So it's all open source. Are, are you continuing work with it? So the project is basically finished. So we placed twenty five tags over three years, yeah. and we think when our funding for continuing the work. But I think all the things are available online, and if any of you are interested in using the accelerometer, I guess if you put it in some species that is less hard to track with, they are really useful resources because they are cheap to produce. And I, I, I just see if there is any opportunities for running this project for longer term, if we have a better approach that can help tackle the problem of body proofing and not having the entire system cracked down by turtles. Mm, interesting. I think it would be great now that we have the, we'll have a recording of your talk, we'll pop it up on Wild Labs and see and link to any of the open source stuff you've published and see what our community, if anyone else picks it up and, and um, uh, takes it forward as well, or is interested in working with you. I'm going to um, say thank you for that talk. That was wonderful. Um, and Thanks. I'm going to move us on to our next speaker, Stefano, something completely different. Um, uh, going to talk to us about drones and 3D mapping and forests. Yeah. Did I thanks. make that up? You are using drones, aren't you? Uh, also, also, yeah. Okay, okay uh, but that's not the focus of this talk. Yeah, well, I guess uh, it is part of it. Um, so I'm Stefano and thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, my work relates a lot to shooting lasers at trees, uh, but despite my kids' excitement, uh, it's not that exciting. You can't actually see the lasers. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have seen 
such data, but this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, um, it can be very detailed. This is a terrestrial laser scanner, but we use drone laser scanners as well. Uh, and uh, we're using this uh, data to get a better understanding of forests uh, and the forest ecology and how we can better manage our forests. Um, so these data uh, really provide us with a really new understanding of how forests uh, look like and the structure of trees. Um, and that alone can really tell a lot of stories about the trees. Uh, and these are stories that uh, can relate to the structure and the, diver the structural diversity. Uh, so we can use this information to understand uh, canopy niches, or we can understand in general, like how diverse a forest ecosystem is. Um, and then once we start to take these trees that we see in these point clouds, um, and we can start to separate them into individual trees, and we can extract the wealth of information from these trees, then we can then take all of these individual trees and bring them back together and look at how uh, that um, forms a community and how we can manage that community in a way that we can provide uh, multiple ecosystem services. Um, as a means to achieve that, uh, we went through the effort of creating two benchmark data sets uh, that are uh, useful to solve some of to get to this uh, uh, work that we're uh, doing. Uh, so one is uh, the four instance data set that aims at uh, providing label data to uh, do instance segmentation of trees, so separating individual trees. And the other one is to say something about the tree species. Uh, so the four instance data uh, was published and is uh, publicly available. You can download it. Uh, there's a Zenodo repo. Um, and it's composed of 1,100 uh, uh, 30 trees uh, across different uh, forest types. Um, and these are drone laser scanning uh, point clouds uh, where you can download this and um, train some deep, le deep learning model to do the uh, semantic and instant segmentation. Um, what is maybe more relevant for the ecology is the tree species classification, which is uh, once we have this uh, individually segmented trees, we want to tell something about what species they are. Um, so we built this uh, quite large database of uh, 20,000 trees. These are all trees that are basically manually segmented, which is a really painful process. Um, and a lot of collaborators provided us with the, that data. Over, we're covering about uh, more than 30 species. Uh, and uh, this is basically what uh, each data point looks like. It's a single tree with a point cloud. And we want to classify the species. Um, what's important to mention is that it's different sensors, both airborne sensors or ground-based sensors that are uh, in, in the data set so that to build some sort of sensor platform, platform agnostic models. Uh, we ran a first, uh, internal data science competition within kind of the forestry community and the forestry AI community. And uh, it was fantastic because we're not that used to have that kind of approach to, to science. So in this case, we were really like able to do five years of research in five months and like really understand what, what methods work best, what not. Um, if you want to see more, there's a GitHub repo out, so you can go and look it up. There's a, the leaderboard, uh, the data is not yet public, but we will publish it uh, once the paper is accepted. This was the winning method. There's basically a multi-view approach that um, project creates different projections of a tree and uses that to classify the tree species. And we saw that I mean, it was very uh, nice uh, confusion matrix, quite quite good accuracy, and the accuracy was constant across sensors. So we could do, we could really have a platform and sensor agnostic model. And the accuracy also was fairly consistent across across tree size. Here on the x-axis, you see two meter height bins, and once we get above trees that are taller than four meters, the accuracy is pretty consistent. Um, 
And that was all for me. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, I, where, where to start? It's, we don't often, part of the reason I invited you is that, um, we, we don't delve into forest monitoring as much as we do animals. And I think the applications of tech, particularly in the AI space, we hear more about applications of AI for camera traps or acoustics rather than um, modeling trees. So it's so interesting because this has such implications for carbon and biodiversity monitoring, right? Are you guys exploring that sort of space? Yeah, very much so, very much so. We are in the, let's say, early steps of like working with the first kind of algorithms that can really uh, then open up towards the applications and the applications being uh, um, forest management, being forest ecology, and, and there's a wealth of information that we're after. We're yeah. just like slowly getting into it. And the reason that the, the process has been slow is partly because we're dealing with this very complex 3D data and all of the deep learning world related to that is lagging a little bit behind compared to image type of models and so on. Mm -hmm. You're getting a heap of questions. Um, uh, but one in particular from Ben was um, says that he's heard that LIDAR is still quite expensive to implement. So how long does it take to map an, an area and make it available for, for an analysis? Well, it, it's always a matter of scale uh, and it's a matter of where you place that LIDAR sensor. Uh, if you have a, a helicopter and you're flying over thousands and thousands of hectares, it gets cheaper. Uh, here uh, in Nordic countries, we have a tradition of having like wall-to-wall -wall nationwide acquisition that are openly available. So there mm -hmm. is a wealth of lighter data available. Um, the, another question from Kat was, um, uh, says that, do you think this could eventually be applied at a more local scale, i.e. for individual individuals monitoring their forests? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's exactly like that. We have this kind of very detailed kind of terrestrial based uh, laser technologies that are for more kind of local um, or in situ measurements. Mm. And then we have kind of we want to upscale those using kind of airborne platforms. Cool. OK, can people contact you if they've got more questions? Please, please do so. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stefano. OK. <laughs> Look at us being on time today. This is, I'm honestly shocked. Absolutely shocked. Um, Ellie, I trust you to take us off time. Look, I actually today kept it pretty short because uh, I was like, I'm always over time. If I had known this, I, I would have added several more unnecessary slides. But okay, let me make sure sound is going to share this time. God forbid anybody doesn't get to hear the ear sound. We didn't hear it last time. Like we lost. Hit. We did lose something from that. So, okay. Can everyone see? Uh, here we go. Oh, oh. No. For some reason, okay. Everyone, ignore what just happened. For some reason, PowerPoint keeps opening random slides lately. It's running weird. But, anyways, it's time for a Wild Labs ad break. Jake, are you here to be the beautiful voice of Wild Labs? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, Take great. it away, Jake. Okay, yeah. So uh, the Wild Labs community had a banner year in 2022 as we launched our new platform, created more community-centered programs, and broke new ground in impactful research and workshops. In our annual report, you'll learn reasons to be proud of your role as one of the 7,700 Tech for Wildlife community members who call Wild Labs home. So visit Wild Labs today to learn more about our engaging programs and interactive platform, how it's helping conservation tech users and makers from around the world to connect, collaborate, and learn together. And there should be a link in the chat. And are you looking to get your own work in front of a global conservation tech audience. Learn to communicate what makes your Tech for Wildlife projects exciting, innovative, and engaging for readers around the world with our Writing Bootcamp. When you post your case studies, articles, project updates, and more on Wild Labs, you're reaching out to people who understand why your work matters. So check out our Bootcamp 
to get advice on writing for the right audience. And visit Wild Labs to share your story today. And back to you, Ellie. All right. Thank you, Jake. That was wonderful. You can find both of those things over on Wild Labs. But now it's time <laughs> for Wild Lab game time. And it's going to be a little different this week because this is Wild Lab game time, Ellie's version. And the reason for that is because this is my last official variety hour. This is my last official time attending as your game master i'll probably uh pop in at some point just as a surprise to visit but i will be moving on from the team after this week and i wanted to make sure that i had some time to let everybody hear this air horn one last time and celebrate with all of you So this week's game is going to be trivia about me, which is why it's a little short. I wasn't going to make everybody sit through 10 questions that are just about me. But this also means they're a little bit stupid. And some of them uh, might be very easy, depending on if you've been paying attention to things that I've said and done over the years. So here we go. First up, what mysterious creature... Did Ellie capture on a camera trap in 2020? Ellie, now there will yes. <laughs> uh, do you want our team to play in as well? Or I feel like you guys people? know all the answers, yeah. so oh, okay. In. So we're giving hints, right? Right. Okay. So you get some hints on some of them. There's one that there's no hints, and you just have to do it off the dome. But this one yeah. has a hint. What is this mysterious creature? Kim suggested it's a cat, a raccoon, a unicorn. Thomas, that is optimistic uh a raccoon a person a tiger hedgehog very close everyone not right yet opossum a bat a kiwi a kiwi a wild stephanie yes no it is actually a raccoon oh my goodness i didn't know that uh, i thought it was squirrel this was, a, this was a bit of a trick question because it was officially called the squirrel cam but there was an imposter one night who visited uh the tweet is supposed to pop up so yes, this was my entry into one of the Tech for Wildlife challenges was the raccoon who stole all of the squirrel's peanuts overnight. And it was one of the happiest days of my life seeing this raccoon pop up uh, on the camera. Next question. Can you name five of Ellie's favorite animals? Now there's no hint for this one. So we're just going to have Condor. raw guesses from people. Condor from Carly. Henry says raccoon. A keeper says dog. Sybil says squirrel. Squirrel, squirrel, raccoon cats. Squirrel, raccoon, unicorn, sloth. <laughs> How many have we got out of five so far? Raccoon, coyote, opossum, squirrel, flying squirrel from Holly. Lion, armadillo, great. There's, I, I think you've got three so far. There's two missing. Turtles, chipmunk, hedgehogs. Elephants, pandas, cap ca capybara. I never can say that. Turtle, giraffe, Bigfoot. The problem with this question is that I do actually love all of these animals, but I did only select five. So we're going to unveil them slowly. Dan, Dan has, has made the point that it's just everyone saying it's their favorite animal now. Correct. Okay. Number one, squirrel. Correct. So these aren't in any uh, particular oh. order I want to emphasize. So I do love squirrels, but there are other animals on here that are tied with the squirrel. Wombat and snail from Holly and Hen Henry. Good choices. Next up, of course, raccoons. Okay. If you've been paying right, attention everyone. during uh, these game shows, you'll know that I love raccoons. No one guessed. Ooh. Rattlesnakes. I love rattlesnakes. I've written about rattlesnakes. I have a, a photography collection of rattlesnakes that I'm going to do something with someday. Uh, but no, I love those little guys. No one guessed Mono. Komodo Dragon. One of my choices since childhood. I think they're very cool. I like that their saliva has a lot of germs and that's how they hunt their prey. I think that's very interesting. And of course, last the condor. is very the condor. <laughs> All right, next question. I was like, there is no way that condor is not on here. 
I feel like <laughs> we'll link to Ellie's like in-depth series on the Condor Tech for Wildlife stuff for sure. I do. So I looked at it last night and I was like, yeah, I'm going to link to it. And I never uh, updated the pages after we changed the platform. So it looks a little wonky. So I'm going to go back in and reformat them. So they look really nice before I go. Uh, all right. Next question. What is Ellie's favorite habitat? Akiva is on point with a Taylor Swift concert. Correct. There's actually so a this is okay. a habitat I've never been to. It's just okay. a habitat I would okay. like to go to and that I, I like hearing about. Okay. Dan's leaving you links to go check out um, uh, uh, raccoons on Twitter. So just make sure you check back that. Uh, Holly oh, says, uh, Savannah, Patagonia from Carly. This is Swamp from Jake. Oh, Antarctica from Steph. <laughs> It is Antarctica. This is, I believe, Alistair's photo of a penguin yes. colony in Antarctica. Uh, I love it. And I think it's very interesting. And I think we need to stop climate change so my favorite habitat doesn't get destroyed. And I think this, nope, okay. There's two more. It's this and one more uh, special one. What animal caused a lockdown at Ellie's high school? This is a true story. An animal got onto campus and caused a lockdown. Bear, chicken, bear, raccoon, rattlesnake, cougar, black bear, uni bear. <laughs> It was a bear. Now this is a picture from Bear ID. It was not a grizzly bear as Bear ID works with. It was just a small black bear, but it was still very exciting. It was maybe the best day of high school. And fine, oh, no. You know what, this is longer than I expected. Congratulations, Steph, I'm gonna get us back on track. What oh, was Ellie's yeah. dream job, dream conservation job as a kid? Uh, wildlife vet? No. No. <laughs> it's very specific. I'll tell people that. It's very, very specific. Canopy Explorer. That is from Stefano, who does not know you very well. Uh, <laughs> marine biologist. Wildlife photographer. Nat Geo. Rattlesnake breeder from Kim. That would be cool, but no. Squirrel rescue. Raccoon poop inspector. Nobody got it. It is the person who operates the puppet to feed baby condors at the zoo. This was my dream conservation job. Uh, I went to the zoo a lot as a kid in the 90s when this program was first uh, getting started. And this was one of the things that they did a lot of presentations about being like, look, we learned how to feed the chicks with this puppet. and It's been really successful. And I imprinted on that like a chick. And I was like, I wish I could do that someday. And I still want to do that someday. If any zoo will ever let me operate the puppet, I will... I will come do it for you. Ellie's final call to action. And as Dan and Brett both say, it is not too late. It is not too late at all. <laughs> yeah, my final call to action is if you work at a zoo or you know someone who works at a zoo, let me come feed the baby condors. I'll do truly, a great job. Truly using our platform for good there, Ellie. And this is the final question. What is Ellie's favorite Taylor's for Tara? Uh, our team needs to be silent during this because I think you guys all know the answer. Oh, there is a do hint. I count as the, do this, I count as the team? This, Carly, no, I think you, you do. I think, but I think you've seen the answer in Slack, though. Ben, some on-point um, Taylor Swift commentary coming through the chat. Do we have any guesses? Midnight's from Holly, Travis Kelsey era from Ben. <laughs> it is, I mean, this is a great new hands era. Down. Hands down. Um, Akiva, this is where my lack of Taylor Swift knowledge hurts me. Look, it is the thing that bonds our team the closest together. Um, Jake can 100% guess. Uh, country era, original uh, OG. Absolutely not. Teardrops on my guitar from Carly. 
It's actually the Reputation era. And this is a photo from the Reputation World Tour where the big snake popped out of the stage. It's a great era. Highly recommend everybody go listen to it, especially Getaway Car, which is about Tom Hiddleston. And with that, before we go back to the show, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has been so nice to me in this community over the last few years and let me learn about all of your cool work and your projects and shared your stories with me. Uh, it has been so nice getting to know all of you and getting to do very stupid games for all of you. And I will still be around. So if anybody wants to get in touch through the internet, I'm on social media, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. You can email me anytime. Send me pictures from your project if you want. I would still love to yeah. see all of the animals you work with. Uh, I, I won't disappear. So please stay in touch. And with that, back to the show. Um, thank you so much, Ellie. And just to say we're so sad that you're leaving and you've added so much to our team and to our community, not least of which are these quizzes and brought the joy and fun to our, uh, how we approach community and tech. So best of luck on your next steps and we can't wait to see where you're going. Thank um, you. Um, so on to our final speakers now. We're back. Ellie, you've taken us right back on track. Um, we've got two speakers. We've got Sybil and um, Tony. Is that right? Yes. Yes, there you are. Hello. hello. Um, hi. So we're going to hear about uh, polar bear ear tagging. And I suspect you might be touching on a few things um, Wing Sing was talking about as well. So hopefully there's a little bit of like crossover there. But do you want to take it away? Yep. Let me see. Hello, everybody. So, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to we finally have the chance uh, to update you a little bit on a, quite a long project. Um, this started actually in 2016, and um, we were working on developing a better ear tag transmitter for Arctic conditions. Um, just a really bit, little bit about polar bears. Um, we have about 25,000, but there's a huge span about estimates between 22 and 31,000 and a lot of lack of knowledge, all the gray, we have no idea really of what's going on. And in some populations, we currently have a decrease mainly due to climate change and disappearing sea ice. In some, we have stable conditions where climate change actually makes the ice better right now, tem temporarily for polar bears. And in some populations, we actually have an increase um, that we're previously hunted heavily and are now better managed and actually are increasing. So it's not all evenly bad right now for polar bears, but the trend is definitely going down. And in many areas, we really don't know yet what's what's going on and how climate change is affecting it. Um, po polar bears right now are studied through um, mark recapture mainly and some of tagging projects. So. Um, in 1988, you know, I just wanted to give a comparison. Your phones, if you had any, looked like this. And in 2023, hopefully, they look something like this. In 88, the polar bear or tags in general, radio collars looked like this, and they still look like that. So nothing much has changed in that regard for technology on monitoring of satellite collars or, or radio collars. Um, and for ear tag transmitters, which is the only way we can really tag male polar bears because their necks are so huge that tags, I mean, the collars don't stick. They just um, can put them off. Um, the ear tag transmitters that have been widely used in other species in the Arctic really don't work well because ice builds up on the external antennas. They break off. Um, people have been trying um, to glue tags onto fur but when you can catch polar bears pretty much right after that they molt and then they lose the tags again so for us to really monitor polar bear uh, males or young really fast growing um, animals uh, there's just not a good way right now um, to do that and so in 2016 we um, assembled pretty much all of the polar bear scientists that work on population monitoring. And then we brought tech companies specifically on 
uh, from Silicon Valley that worked on internal antennas and um, development of of better you know phones and said, well, can you help us in the conservation community to develop, develop better ear tag transmitters? And so we we brought also um, community members who oftentimes have concerns about tagging polar bears that you know they affect polar bear hearing or um, you know whatever uh, in lifestyle that that they can't survive so well. So we all came together and put requirements together what we want from a better tag. And so the specifications that we brought to the development community were that one, we really wanted a, a small size transmitter that can be on a polar bear's ear um, that doesn't impede them, that um, has small dimensions, specifically maximum what you see here, that don't weigh more than 40 grams, um, that have a battery life. So there are some tags that were used on polar bears, but they usually didn't last more than about three months because of the cold. The battery really wore out fast. But we wanted something that if we put it on, that it at least goes through one calendar year that we can follow the, the whole year of, of the life cycle. Um, so we wanted that antenna issue that it is internally, uh, ideally with a temperature sensor uh, in the tag and um, that is uh, conform with plastics that don't break in the cold and that don't get brittle. So those were kind of the requirements we put to the tech community. Um, and we worked with IDEO and Misty West to um, develop and help us develop pro a prototype. And this is where I hand over to Tony, who um, is going to walk us through what we what IDEO and Misty West did um, on furthering the technology on that. Yeah, so um, so yeah, you could see some of the photos here. We're essentially trying to design something that could be packed into such a small form factor and fit on the polar bear's ear. Um, and so I think these are, this is like a, a, a part on the left there trying to, to evaluate the fit. I believe that's a mock-up on a polar bear ear on oh, the yeah, right. Oh, sorry. I, I forgot to say that. Yeah, that was still my my so we so we did actually measure a polar bear's ear. We brought the design of the the green is really the the measurements of a, a real polar bear ear so the um designers had, you know, real measurements of what it would look like and that's that that one. And so then oh, here we came, they started with a design of the form factor with some of the, the grams that you see, what they weighed and to, to land more closer to the 40 grams. So now it's Tony. <laughs> yeah, so you could see here uh, some photos of the tag that we developed. Um, all of this would be potted in, in an epoxy layer to protect it. Um, yeah. Here, can we go on to the next slide here? So in terms of specs for the first prototype that was developed, um, you can see here on the dimensions and on the weight, um, we were able to get around five to six months of, of lifetime out of it, depending on the transmit mode. Um, and it does have an onboard temperature and pressure sensor that it reads and summarizes for and uploads that over satellite. Um, yeah, we, there's a variety of modes down there. The Bluetooth to connect through the tag once it's uh, been potted is quite helpful so that we can can adjust things. Um, this, yeah, there were a couple of challenges in getting it to work. Um, one of them is the battery is really trying to get something that is light enough, can operate down to the low temperatures and last a lifetime, while also being able to handle being hammered by the transmit uh, power. Like it's essentially, it, there's almost no power being consumed when the radio is off. And when the radio is on, it's this huge burst and the battery needs to be able to withstand that. Um, we found the Tadiran or Tadiran TLM 1550 family as a good option for this. Um, yeah. There's one that you didn't mention, but we, I think there was a contender before, but it was working well, and then the military bought them all. So that was one of the sourcings of the battery. That was a, a, a real setback to us that we had just dialed it in with one. And then all of a sudden, I, I guess it coincided with the Ukraine um, war, the military bought them all, and now they're not available. So we had to start from scratch, <laughs> which battery to use. 
One other issue was trying to get the the antenna to work uh, inside the potted compound. So there there were some like board antennas and some reference antennas that or that were used, um, but we struggled to get them to be able to transmit through through the uh, the encapsulant, um, and we weren't able to fit an off the shelf antenna into the package. Um, so what you could see here is this is unpotted and on the bottom right there, you can see the combination board and wire antenna there. This is a, a test jig that was uh, measuring the RF properties of it. Slow. Um, I'm, I'm forwarding, but it's not going. <laughs> yeah, here. it's come through. Um, yeah, the encapsulation was also tricky trying to get the right compound that could, uh, it, could, it was tough enough to withstand and at the temperatures we needed while also being transparent enough to the antenna transmissions. Um, I think the, what the team settled on was a mix of glass beads and epoxy in a multi-step process. Um, but it was, yeah, so we've published the, uh, I believe the mix as well as the process. Um, yeah, trying to get this, this dialed in and get this consistent so that the but because this also would impact the antenna performance. Um, so yeah, this was challenging to get dialed in. All right, it's really slow. Yeah. All good. Um, there were some future considerations out of this project that we were, were looking for. So implementing the ability to switch the tag off externally with a magnet um, would have been quite helpful here. Uh, the first implementation had uh, some current leakage problems and was bypassed. Um, there's also there's further things that we could do to reduce the power consumption. Um, so, like for example, there's I believe the next generation of Argos chips, or uh, yeah, have come out that that can perform there. Um, there's some things we could do in there's further tuning that we could do. There's further component swaps. Um, the also the the potting process was quite finicky, um, and so yeah, finding a partner that could uh, make that process very consistent and more automatable or or more quick to do would be quite helpful here. Yeah. So, in terms of results, we delivered five prototype trackers. Um, we've also open sourced all of the design files over at uh, that link there which I will share in the chat after this. Um, I don't believe we they've gone on to polar bears yet though, right? They've... No, I mean, the, the problem is that the prototypes themselves weren't um, reliable enough yet to really um, deliver them on wild polar bears. Um, and because of some of the challenges still that we haven't resolved, like, um, the on off switch and the the what what um tony said so we we've only tested them in the field you know without putting on a polar bear so we wanted to, to resolve and um before we bring them to market before we put them on on polar bears themselves so we've just walked around with them and they did work but um as tony said there are there's still some challenges to to resolve to bring them to market Yeah, so essentially what we see is the next step is doing another design iteration based on the learning as well as based on advances in in components and in in new chips. Um, there's a couple of paths that we see forward for um, for funding or essentially enabling the work on that. Um, one of them would be to find a commercial tracking tag company that wants to partner with the WWF and commercialize this into a product. Um, the files, so the, the full design is open source and all of the, the work that we did on it has been published. Um, and it's published under the MIT license. So it, uh, a commercial tag, tag tracking company could start with the, uh, the development work around say the antenna and the potting and whatnot, and integrate it with their product line and, and commercialize that product. Um, another option would be um, further funding from either government sources or donors or whatnot to to fund continued development. Um, another option would be to shift this into an open hardware project. Um, 
and solicit development from the community. Uh, if there are folks who have done open hardware projects or participated in them, who would be who I could talk with about what that would look like or who might be interested in taking on this project, I would love to chat with y'all. Yeah, and, and I guess to basically reiterate why um, tags really haven't developed since the 80s is, is that cost point because um, you, we as WWF and the US Fish and Wildlife Service have put in uh, quite a bit of money into this point for this, just making this progress where we are. And um, the, the manufacturer said to us right from the beginning that we're in 2016 at the meeting that they just don't have that kind of uh, R&D money between you know, 600,000 to a million to put forward to, um, to, to improve the tag. It was good enough for them. They made money. And so that's basically where we are is why development has stopped. Um, it is is quite a bit of money, but I think we're far enough ahead now that what we have de developed so far could be taken up by a tech company without putting much more money into it and hopefully commercially produce it. And so that's basically where we are, but it's not come to market because of a few things, especially like the potting also that these companies know how to do. They, they do it with collars that they could take the internal development of the antenna and integrate it. So we actually are looking for input you guys might have and ideas of how we could connect to companies or what what ideas you would have to take it forward. So that's kind of where we are with this. It's further, but it's not quite done. And I would love some input and questions. So there was a lot of chat, um, uh, conversation in the chat from, um, different community members. Brett, do you want to jump in? And then Thomas and Akiba, I might throw to you guys because I can see you guys have comments. Oh, Brett, I know I was chatting to you and you weren't talking about it. Do you have a microphone? Uh, I do. I, I didn't have a particular uh, comment at the moment. Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, Thomas, I know you're talking, uh, you, you were commenting on the Argos developments. Do you want to jump in? Sure. I will just add that um, some of the issue, or at least one of the issues mentioned um, in terms of Argos was the power requirement right now um, to transmit on the system is pretty high. I'd say on average, uh, all manufacturers are somewhere between 350 milliwatts to 500 milliwatts, meaning every single transmission is roughly half of a watt. Um, that will change with the new system that is uh, starting to be launched end of quarter one of next year. So we're adding 25 satellites to the constellation. There's only nine today, so we're adding uh, you know, twice as many, if you will. And that will uh, add new different ways of transmitting messages, um, different ways of formatting messages. But the take home is that uh, we will now have a way to transmit a, a very low power requirement of 150 milliwatts. So that will help improve uh, battery longevity. Uh, maybe you can just simply use smaller batteries that are more appropriate for that type of environment, um, things like that. So, Yeah, we're super excited about that. Um, also, I think from what I remember of talking with the engineers that were working on this, the the there was some optimism about being able to retransmit less because we're more likely to hit a satellite with more things up there. So yeah, we're really excited for this new constellation to come up and I think that's going to uh, open up a lot of, of new applications for this. Yeah, to, to quickly add to that. So today, um, worst case scenario in terms of uh, when you would see a satellite, so the frequency or the, I should say, the gap between satellite passes can be almost six hours at the equator. Uh, that will improve to about 15 minutes at the equator. Um, but at that point in time, we're looking at probably quarter four, 2024, quarter one, 2025 for that to happen, but uh, quite significant. And then, of course, as you get closer to the poles, it's almost real time um, in terms of satellite availability once the whole constellation is built out. There was a question here about uh, potting hurting the transmitting signal and my understanding is yes, that it was trickier to get it out. Um, but uh, so maybe you can give more light on this. Essentially, you mentioned the the antennas breaking off and freezing and whatnot. That 
yeah, we didn't have a lot of choice for trying to stick one external because they don't survive. Yeah, I mean, that that already exists with ear tag transmitters. And that was the main break point is the external antenna would always break off because of ice buildup. Um, so that just ha has to be internalized. And the potting in the end, the tests were, I think um, they were acceptable. I mean, they were a little bit less, but uh, always better than having no antenna at all, basically. <laughs> There's also a bunch of RF work needed to to shape the beam around the polar bear's head, because in in the first implementations, like the the trying to transmit besides such a large like mass of of tissue, like it, it really does impact the signal quite a bit. So, but I think there, if you look in the GitHub repo, there's a report analyzing different shapes and different impacts through. Um, <laughs> Yeah, different impacts through of, of different shapes on, on that absorption. That's super interesting. So in the, just that last minute or two, um, and we'll have after hours to have more of a, a engineering type chat. Um you so how far away are you from this being um off the shelf ready to use? Is it and, and what are the the barriers between between you and there is it finding new partners to pick it up and and move it forward is it funding is it engineering partners what's the most urgent thing well it's basically one of the three options that tony showed it's it's either we keep find find money to keep paying misty west to help us finish yeah. it um, or we find a, a corporate partner that tr produces tags that takes what we've developed so far and takes the open source data and then takes it over the line with their expertise. Mm -hmm. Or it's trying to do uh, an open hardware project with some of the questions we still have and some expert on potting takes what we have and tries to maximize that or or um yeah so it's so the the challenge is specifically on some of the engineering that you make it open up but that i see as very difficult because it, it takes somebody in the middle to coordinate the whole thing yeah for sure um that, that knows tech you know that i i certainly i mean <laughs> i don't know enough to really understand it really I and mean, we've been coordinating the different pieces but the engineers at, at misty west have really been the ones that that do all the the development of it mm. yeah um i'm gonna wrap us up for the formal part of the the show and i just want to say a big thank you to you sybil and tony for for talking through that project and i i know we've been getting comments in the chat that it's it's been great to see this hear an update of where this project has got to because we've been hearing about it for so long so thank you for coming along and, and laying it all out so beautifully um for everyone else, uh, for all our speakers, a big thank you to you too. And um, thank you to everyone for joining us this month. And we'll see you next month um, uh, for Variety Hour last week, last Wednesday of the month. And um, in the meantime, we'll see you on Wild Labs. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.